having any kind of creative outlet keeps you sane when you stop being happy it need not be, be that e- sad. equal to sad it could be that now you are equanimity emotions by definition are chemical reactions that are transient we are tiring ourselves out over things that frankly don't deserve that much of attention the more neuroscience i read the more i'm convinced that the conscious has very little role to play in anything humanity is in an unfortunate space where there is some control but not enough over analyze at your own risk <laughs> <laughs> siddharth warrior goes on many podcasts he talks about a lot of things all of us learn so much about our minds from him so we decided to get him on and talk about a lot of things which he hasn't spoken about before for you to not just understand your mind and so many aspects of it but really like look at the future and see where that could really go plus some really interesting things in there for all of you to use in your day to day lives but before we go there i want to make sure you hit subscribe and smash that bell icon and be going straight into my chat with sadat warrior the tough part of what preparing for a podcast episode with you mm. is that what do i talk to you about that will be okay i have spoken about this enough i'm excited to talk about it yeah. with you because you get pulled into these conversations from all angles so i thought it would be interesting to kind of let the audience kind of give me certain pointers they're interested in and then we'll free wheel is what i'll thought that's but, good yeah because who better than ask people saying how, what do they want to know about their mind sort of before questions from people want to ask you saying you know you went down this journey of creating content alongside your profession yeah. at some point what do you think each has learned from the other that's an excellent question nobody has been asked that so um, i have learned from the medical part i have learned that you can work harder than you think always that's always my lesson from residency from you know doing uh, from doing my residency in government hospitals that's what i've realized you think that you can't work harder but you can if you want to so that's been a useful lesson overall in terms of resilience from this content creation side it's actually not new for me because i used to write poetry before and i still do so i have found that having that outlet having any kind of creative outlet keeps you sane because that's like the one thing that you can hold on to that is yours so even if everything else is chaotic or going crazy you know that you still have that voice and sometimes that's a thread that you can hold on to which for me is very important do you think everybody needs that uh, you know this is that whole left brain right brain thought process mm. right and uh, you you if you google it you get that one image of this one colorful one and which one very like an boring analytical looking one um a is that actually a thing is that how that functions but do you believe everybody needs both ends to to feel more balanced it's not exactly accurate but i love what it represents so as an art form that image makes a lot of sense as an anatomical drawing not so much yeah. Uh, but yeah the balance between discipline of sticking to a schedule of doing something even when you don't feel motivated and the other side which is following your passion doing something on a whim hmm. just not overthinking it being chaotic both of these things are important for you to grow hmm. and people struggle myself included we struggle to find that balance because when we do only one thing we realize that we are not growing hmm. and sometimes we can overcompensate and go too on many the things other side and take on too many things and start too many things and explore too scattered, many things yeah. it becomes scattered suddenly you are in the middle of clutter and then you get a my room is so untidy let me clean up everything let me organize everything yeah which so lasts for one it. day <laughs> yes <exactly. laughs> one day is what it lasts <laughs> so that that balance that seesaw between discipline and chaos for me is that balance of left brain right brain mm-hmm. where you have 
uh, you have motivation you have discipline and you also explore art but i also ask this because you know there was this interesting thing i was reading the other day about just generally how even emotions flow right um is that when you you realize when we have like peak elation when peak happiness you always feel that withdrawal which feels like a low very close right after that and i was reading that that happens because your brain's trying to balance you out like balance out i i forget the the chemical but there is a certain balancing rebalancing is doing to kind of bring you back to normalcy but do you feel a, a large part of the of what the brain's trying to do is to make sure that you are not swinging into one extreme and kind of coming back to some form of of being centered being or or is that is that me simplifying it no it it is important to simplify it otherwise these conversations can never happen um but the the interesting thing is emotions are felt and described at so many levels so at one level it is a neurotransmitter going and sitting in a in a chemical synapse and kick starting an electrical reaction that is a very zoomed in approach from there all the way to what we feel is a big journey so when we say we are happy what we we are trying to interpret those chemical reactions so if there is a dopamine surge which is the neurotransmitter that is commonly associated with pleasure mm-hmm. at some point that dopamine surge will stop and it will come down it is unfortunate that we can associate that with sadness so when you stop being happy hmm. it need not be, be sad. equal to sad it could be that now you are equanimity you know you're coming back to equanimity yeah but that is not an emotion that we usually deal with yeah. so we are either happy or sad yeah that is a conversational change that needs to happen you know that word equanimity it's tough to pronounce so i've i've yeah. always gotten stuck and i came across it i was reading about mental fitness the other day mm-hmm. you know almost that progression from mental health to mental fitness yeah. and this word is one of the core like it is almost always one of the pillars of yeah can you explain that a little bit more for someone who doesn't get what it means and how that kind of plays into your mind for me the best way to look at it is uh, how we are always reacting to things so if imagine if you are walking down the a supermarket like if you are walking down the aisle everything that you see will elicit some kind of reaction either a attraction a i want this or a repulsion that oh i hate this this is how the brain is wired we are always choosing or rejecting things equanimity is when you are doing neither and you are just observing never an easy thing to do but it's what human beings are capable of much more than animals are so to not do that is i feel a wasted opportunity but it's it's tough to to follow right it's it's i'm gathering it requires you to almost like train yourself to follow that because our tendency is always to kind of flip around yeah um and i feel often times especially I, i look at today's day and age it feels like we flip for two ends a lot more than being at the center constantly yeah but how how do you work towards that step one would be to be aware of this hmm. uh, back and forth because if you think of the actions that you do throughout the day hmm. how many of them are actions and how many of them are reactions true majority would be reaction you say something because somebody said something you do something because you saw something everything is a reaction to an external stimulus yeah it's not because you wanted it by yourself yeah, yeah and once you start observing that then you can work your way back and figure out what are the things that you are acting hmm. and what are the things that you are reacting to yeah. so you should ideally be acting more and reacting yeah. less yeah and the best way to do it is to just insert some time between the stimulus and the action take a pause between take it a pause. to to not push this on You're welcome for that very small <laughs> very plug-in. small <laughs> plug-in. <laughs> and and it's interesting to say this because I was just trying to like read up on stuff which I thought would be interesting that happened and one of the things said that you know 
you when you taking that that pause you're also if you can almost understand that you know that surge of emotion you feel yeah if you let that subside a little bit and also like actually the surge is the point when it starts to subside yeah. um and if you wait for that to pass is the right time for action and and to respond rather than when it's at its peak the the challenge is that most of our motivation comes from emotions hmm so people will find it difficult to act at all if they don't act during that peak of emotion so january 1st everybody is motivated because there's a lot of energy yeah. gyms are full yeah but then that emotion dies out yeah. that motivation will slowly subside then people don't go anymore that is the problem of linking up action to emotion hmm. because emotions by definition are chemical reactions that are transient they will go mm. and so if you are linking up your action to that then that means that your action will be transient which is the opposite of consistency does that and consistency brings me to habits because is the way to really be able to find this balance to say okay i'm not focusing on you know just like reacting to things i'm just setting systems that i'm constantly following so i'm i'm almost taking away this need to find that i'm not reacting just on the emotion i'm reacting to this thing would yeah, you say so that's true a habit can never be a reaction hmm so if it is a reaction it's not a habit yeah so a habit is when you don't have a choice and we are wired to think that choices are good more choice the better which is unfortunately the yeah. biggest scam that has been pulled on us yeah that's the choices. biggest one. yeah when so, you say choice i i remember reading about this um if you walk into an american supermarket hmm. the amount of breakfast cereals you see yeah. it's an immense number right and all flashy yeah. colors all this thing and then i'm in india now we're slowly getting a lot more we've gotten a lot more variety but i think that just that color rush that you get by looking at everything that's there is is yeah. crazy and just the the amount of choice that they end up getting is just pushing them into like okay let's go after the flashiest color versus what's healthy or what's right for you yeah. or picking the right thing you can't because the cognitive load is so much hmm. that um, in fact the way supermarkets are designed is to tire you out they're designed to tire out your decision making hmm. so that by the end of it your brain can only make so much choices yeah so by the time you're halfway through it your brain is done making choices Yeah. So it's like chalo utha lete hain like let's pick it bhook lag rahi hai let's put two more biscuits yeah. in the end when you are at the checkout counter there's a chewing gum i mean do i really want chewing gum doesn't matter let's put it yeah. you know you will you will find things and you won't think too much because your brain is literally out of energy and that is the problem in today's world that we are tiring ourselves out over things that frankly don't deserve that much of attention yeah because we have a constant rush of options and choices and you're also at a point where like i f- i forget the the actual name for it it's it i think someone called it the uh, the shopping cart syndrome or something like that um i know the multiple terms is that you get that rush when you hit add to cart yeah and not necessarily when you get the actual thing and so there was this interesting uh, point so i think I, i think i read on twitter where someone said that i just keep adding stuff to cart and ignoring it and eventually taking it off so i get the surge i don't have to pay the money for it <laughs> which was an ingenious way to get that at least a, a minute part of that rush because once oh, yeah. you get the thing you don't care about it as much you yeah. want to buy the next thing and the next thing after that because it's so yeah. easy to just keep adding stuff to cart that's a great startup idea yeah if you could have a filter on top of amazon yeah where it gives you all the pleasure <laughs> of Just buying and if you want it'll even send an empty box to your yeah. <laughs> house yeah and um, you get the pleasure of opening it also and you're done it's um, somebody should do that yeah you know there's something to design and designing for neuroscience and uh, designing for the mind yeah. and i feel it's always been a thing but people haven't realized it like it's about what colors you use in specific spaces yeah. what you put at the checkout counter like we just spoke about i remember talking to a, a couple of people who had worked with star sports on embedding neuroscience into advertising doing the ipl oh, yeah um 
when you look at how you design spaces and 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 especially things like that what does what seems to be the open secret that everybody seems to know that the consumer doesn't know this whole thing is under neuromarketing hmm. which is understanding decision making and how can you manipulate them or yeah. how can you influence them so there was a study that um, that showed how the last advertisement that somebody sees before entering the supermarket the chances of them buying that product are 30% higher just on account of having seen that image before they enter the supermarket that's it so uh, can advertisers want their product to be the last thing you see and so it makes sense for them to constantly bombard you everywhere all the time because the it increases the chances of you buying it in in terms of design i love that we are now talking about this because it means that we can now reverse engineer this and use it for our own benefit because it ties up with what we were saying before that we are reactionary animals we are not action taking animals so once we accept that yeah we can stop putting so much pressure on ourselves to act perfect to act disciplined and instead put our energies into designing a system that can make us react in the way we want yeah which for me makes a lot more sense so even if you take an example of this podcast setup mm. Mm. because you have the chair in place the mics in place everything is already in place the friction for you to record a podcast is mm. so much lesser yeah versus if you had to set this up every time so true right so this is a great example of design helping us achieve more but for that you need to think about it and create that system yeah and everybody should be doing this but people are not people in, instead do the opposite they will create more friction they will make it more difficult for themselves and then wonder why am i not being disciplined why yeah. am i struggling yeah that's the sad thing it's that o- o- old thing people say na that keep your desk clean right. so you can feel clutter free and i feel that's in many ways that 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 makes sense like i have a lot of post its which are few like to do lists and a few other things just there on the right side of my desk at all times yeah. um not that i ever refer to them and i at some point stop doing to do lists i just have stuff which i know and it like my broader purpose points etc which i've worked on i just have it there so it's like yeah. it's there to remind me so it's also I'm not going off that radar yeah. but a lot i'm just trying to tap into what you just said do you see a lot of that being more focusing on the subconscious than conscious and yeah. then if we know it there's a then transmit go away from the subconscious to the conscious so the more neuroscience i read the more i'm convinced that the conscious has very little role to play in anything the conscious is literally just that it is conscious hmm. of things but that's it everything else is happening all the decision making is happening at much deeper levels of the cortex and subcortex mm. Mm. so if you look at the brain anatomically um, the decision making protocol kind of goes from below upwards mm. so every level one step below has veto power on the one on top so if the most evolved part of the brain says go to the gym mm. but the one level below says i'm it's it's a cozy winter morning i'm <laughs> yeah. under two blankets yeah then that can have veto power but the one below mm. if the spinal cord mm. senses that you know your finger is burning or there's somebody pricking you you will get up so at every level the older the system mm. the more veto power it has yeah that's how the brain and the neural system is designed so i i'm feeling more and more convinced that we have put far too much pressure mm. on our so called conscious selves to be in a certain way yeah without really giving it the power to do so which is unfortunate it's just and it's a and it's a flip right what you just said the if the oldest part has the most and and that the fire one i'm guessing and, and it's also the fact that it's so ingrained in us from like caveman times that you know exactly. you put your hand in fire your hand will burn right. it's almost like if you call it brain muscle memory kind of stuck on yeah. and and kind of moving with you like a reflex yeah 
how do you kind of at some points and this is why i feel the entire let's say the neuralink project all that stuff so interesting is that if at some point you flip it and say no you're giving this part a lot more a obviously none of us have an answer but it would also make it imbalance right there's a reason why it, i'm guessing this is in these yeah. steps but if you suddenly give more control to the youngest part or the newest one would that like literally spiral how we react is is an important question and that's kind of what is happening mm. like humanity is in an unfortunate space where there is some control but not enough mm. and so there is a constant argument between the two parts of the brain as to how things should be mm. so the limbic system things that whatever is happening right now is the most important thing yeah. so am i getting enough food am i am i safe am i warm am i do i have friends do i have power do i have money all of these things are really important to the limbic system because it helps in survival hmm. do i have a partner do am i am i in a relationship do i have sex all those things are core drives hmm. the the prefrontal cortex which is the most evolved part of the brain has these different ideas of of uh, of of justice mm. and uh, morality and how things should be in yeah. 10 years down the line the limbic system doesn't care 10 years down the line what's what's now it's it wants what's now so 1000 rupees today is worth more than 5000 rupees in 3 years mm. because what is 3 years yeah. it, wh- who knows what will happen in 3 yeah. years the limbic yeah. system definitely doesn't yeah so the way we look at life is very different depending on which part of the brain is looking and that's why it's a problem and animals don't have this problem hmm. because their prefrontal cortex isn't evolved as much we have this problem maybe in 10000 years our next version of humanity won't have that problem because the prefrontal cortex will be evolved enough we are in that middle zone hmm. neither here nor there and that's why all these confusions are happening and there's a question that comes actually one of the questions that kind of came in which i feel connects to this is that when you are looking at the evolved mind is there the reason why sometimes we wander in thought a lot more than focusing on the present so do we almost have to go back to the most in i would say ancient part of it yeah say focus on now uh, and this question really was how do i keep my mind in the present moment it always wanders yeah that might not necessarily be a bad thing because you're wanting you're allowing your evolved mind to actually look at i mean as long as it's wanting towards interesting things i guess yeah this is this is one of the most conflicting uh, things that i had i've realized that being in the present hmm. is something that all animals do yeah they are in the they're present they're so clearly in the present right yeah. they're rooted to here and now yeah. we on the other hand are not in the present in terms of our prefrontal cortex so our prefrontal cortex has the capacity to create stories imaginations fantasies so we are there yeah our limbic system is still in the present when we say that we should be in the present and mindfulness and meditation what we mean is that our prefrontal cortex should be in the present hmm and that is the challenge because it it has so much to explore that it prefers to do all of those things and instead of staying here and now so you're actually finding things that it will find interesting which makes sense cuz you know if you if you have followed any guided meditation they'll always say find one thing to focus on and i yeah. uh, i remember um, talking to someone uh, or I was listening to a meditation with someone about vipassana mm. and some of the early vipassana meditations that they were asked to they were asked to do was literally sit i think the first and that is just focus on just the upper lip part and what you're feeling there right. for the entire day's meditation right. which means you're literally saying find something interesting in the most like tiny like aspect which you, i'm i'm sure your prefrontal is going mad at that point thing yes. this is not interesting i want to think about other things right um it's, and how they keep saying focus on your breath so you're almost giving things for it to focus on yeah it's it's difficult because it is scary hmm. our brain is wired to constantly scan the environment it's like hitting the refresh button yeah. you know how we are used to just clicking refresh for no reason yeah. just to see if something else is happening that's what the brain does every 8 to 10 seconds it hits refresh hmm. literally where you just scan the environment to see if has something changed 
and if anything has changed then that is important because to the brain that could be a predator that is about to come and kill you so that's why instagram and tiktok works amazing because it keeps changing yeah so your brain's attention is completely hooked paying attention to your breath for a day would is torture because it means completely giving up that sense of is something about to happen yeah. that sense of threat yeah you have to give up completely in order to do that yeah and that is difficult because we have never done that from the moment that we are born we have always been under threat yeah. which is why they all kind of also make you go gradually they never say the first meditation is like 1 hour 2 hours like 5 yeah. minutes and right. then 10 minutes and a couple of hours and yeah what you just said about instagram and tiktok i'm just thinking while you were saying about if you look at the phone hmm. you've technically made a device that is functioning like your mind because yeah. it is always refreshing it's it's almost like you think can i take this all the triggers that it requires yeah. and just putting it in my hand which in my head is a whole different context to what we all already talk about social media and the phone but literally saying it's it's literally your mind in your hand yeah. because it has all the same triggers it's inciting the same triggers that you need huh. and and now you you're saying you're going to put that Inside. with glasses on your face <laughs> in your head putting a chip in there oh that's a whole different uh, can of worms so it's going to happen yeah it is inevitable yeah we put a chip in our head yes which is why it becomes almost urgent that everybody knows how the brain works hmm. in fact i feel it should have happened even when radio came out or when television came out the only problem is we didn't know the like the medical community or the scientist community didn't know how the brain really worked mm. it is only in the last 10 30 years that uh, we've understood majority of neuroscience yeah and our understanding will keep improving but it cannot be limited to only a few like a small section of society because the, it impact is seen in everyone so it's it's almost urgent that we start teaching kids how their brain works because yeah. once you start putting vr glasses on them they will have trouble understanding what is real and what is not yeah and these are philosophical questions that earlier only you know like a few monks would ask yeah but now every kid is going to ask that what is real yeah because if you put on vr glasses suddenly you are fighting zombies yeah and you take it off and you are not so how does that make sense you know my 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 daughter started to play roblox mm. um i noticed that she was she gets limited screen time in the week she was watching roblox videos on on youtube kids and then said do you want to play it so i and i always try to scan what she's playing and stuff and i've seen her go from someone who wouldn't game in that sense to now whenever it, she gets it and whenever she can play it ai yeah, i'm seeing cognitive sense really kind of skill up because she started off as because she had to learn how to use two hands yeah. to do the thing on the ipad but she's also learning how to navigate through specific things and yeah. but the part of me is also like little worried saying once i got to understand the ramifications of what this means for a 5 and a half year old's mind right. um so it's very limited quantity there yeah but what you said makes me think that rather than telling them this is what the effect might be if we actually teach them this is how the mind works first yeah. and then go to the effect yeah. they might get it a lot better i think they would you just have to explain it in their words but all children create a a world or or a mind map of the world in their own way actually all adults every human being does this because not everybody is educated in the same way but that doesn't mean that they don't have a world view it's just that their world view depends on their level of education and the words that they have and the concepts that they have so children will also form a world view and if you give them this information they will take it and they will make sense of it in their own way i think even faster than most adults will yeah because they don't have any preconceived biases so if you tell them that this is how the brain works then okay this is how the brain works and that is very useful information the uh, for me the biggest challenge is not the brain's development i think the brain's brain will develop in fact quicker in uh, in kids who are born now and in the future what i am worried about is the connection between the brain and the body because i feel more and more we are we don't need all of this quite literally the reason that evolution gave us muscles and fingers and legs was for a purpose 
and we are going away from that so it doesn't make sense anymore to work out it doesn't make sense to run it doesn't make sense to do because any of this because you don't even if you decide to i mean it's like that i forget which uh, if you look at the animated movie wally right what they had is at some point they could walk right because they were suddenly like what robots and ai was doing everything and you were just sitting right and eventually you just levitating across the place on 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 robotic things right but it's interesting that this is the point of time i feel people are focusing on fitness the most <laughs> compared to any other generation but you're not doing it for survival you're doing this because i mean this whole thing of connecting how you perform physically connects to how your mind works would you yeah. say then that doesn't hold as much ground anymore no it it holds even more truth now because the brain is connected to the body and if the body suffers the brain suffers but this time we don't know why so somebody who could be very successful and is ticking all the boxes for things that should make them happy might not be happy and not know why and that is really frustrating and they are probably going through that because there is a there is something happening in their physical self that is not keeping their ecosystem in place so i feel that as a society we are kind of understanding this maybe instinctively that we need to move more we need to work out our bodies more because there are still hormones that are re- released only when you have muscle growth and our brain needs those hormones so one way to keep your testosterone levels high is by working out regularly if your testosterone levels drop you can have problems in discipline in focus you can have depression there was a study that showed uh, in rats um, there was this, there was a difference in their in their mood after putting in testosterone there were so there is a lot of studies on the impact of exercise and good sleep on mental health so definitely how your body does is reflected in the mind but the only difference here is that instead of letting it be a natural form of these things we have i mean just think of sleep right and 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 the amount we speak for sleep it's also leading to an entire ecosystem of saying we focus on sleep is becoming more which is why now suddenly you have entire product lines and categories of people coming up with stuff everything from a sleep tea to uh, to tablets to everything else which help kind of put that in to like sleep tracking for you to like yeah. like i i was obsessed to that initially when i first got that tracking on the watch and i would actually yeah. wake up in the morning and check how much was my rem sleep versus how right. much was the other thing and and i experimented by saying if i listen to a guided sleep meditation before i go to bed does that increase my rem sleep or do i go to my rem sleep faster and i actually saw that that was true that if i listen yeah. to listen to a meditation for and i normally do like a, i do that every night before going to sleep i do a 10 minute just earphones on and i take it off yeah so i don't i don't pass out with it i take it off most days some days i pass a terrible habit <laughs> um but when i looked at the tracking the rem sleep is much higher right which i found super uh, so i mean the whole point of biohacking i mean would you call this new are you mixing biohacking with neural hacking or is it all the no they are all part of the same hmm. conversation uh so the best part of this whole feedback mechanism is that we understand our body better hmm. that is always good so earlier we didn't know why somebody would suddenly be dropping down unconscious but later on we were able to check their blood and check their blood sugar yeah that is very useful we now we know the chemical constituents of blood now we are getting into the brain feedback so we can look at eeg we can look at uh, you know what is the level of sleep we still haven't come up with devices that can take use of this but i think that's a matter of time the more we understand ourselves the better it is i i truly believe that the only thing is that sometimes too many variables can mess us up you know if uh, if we have to think about too many things again it is the supermarket effect all over again so we don't want that much we don't want that many choices so for me biofeedback is something that you should probably do once in a year just like you do your blood pressure check up your sugar check up your creatinine check up just make sure everything is okay and then go back to your everyday life do you feel that we'll come to a point and i'm i'm circling back to one of the points you spoke about earlier which was how our emotions really drive our actions 
it will come to a point where the same way how we figuring out sleep and figuring out some of these would we'll be able to come to a point where actually be able to like is there an emotion hack at some point that kind of can be put in so i can think about how i feel angry how i feel sad and how that functions for me as an individual i think so uh, once we figure out why this happens and to a large extent we already know like the basic networks that are in the brain we mm. already know mm. when it comes to fear when it comes to anger we understand it at least the scientists understand it i think the it Regular still person. hasn't per, uh, yeah it, is, it still hasn't sunk into the everyday conversation but it will so if if you break your arm and you are unable to lift something with your arm people can see it mm. and they can say that oh it's because you've had a arm fracture that you can't lift it but we don't talk about how what trauma does to somebody's emotions yeah. in that way because you can't see it it's all vague yeah it's only a matter of time once we can figure out that all right so you are more threatened by certain situations because you've had these past experiences yeah. and this is how you have to heal so that you can become all right again yeah once we start talking about things in that way and in a completely non judgmental way mm. i think that the way we look at mental health will change and also because all of us react to situations so differently as individuals yeah. so it's not a i mean i i know that that goes for the body as well but that's the the hypotheticals because it's not definitive in terms of you, there's no actual metric to to catch it yet yeah it's like one of the questions that came in is saying why do i cry when i'm angry mm not everybody cries when they're angry but a, a, a large amount of people do so if stuff like that is that how do you even is the reasoning the same for every person who cries when they're angry or is it different so crying is interesting because um crying is conveying helplessness or crying is a call for help now helplessness we usually associate with sadness or grief but anything can make you helpless any strong emotion can make you helpless and so your your brain doesn't really divide between the final outcome if you're feeling helpless it will trigger that crying response so if you you could be helpless out of sadness you could be helpless out of laughter you could be helpless out of happiness any time you're overwhelmed by emotion to an extent that you can't make decisions anymore you start crying because it's somebody come and help me so anger can also make you feel helpless and so you'll cry So what about people who don't so I why I brought that up is it's an interesting one right because you know you there's always that I go back to college you would have people who would say but but I don't cry mm. um so the threshold is that a threshold piece or is that in some cases it is not something which really applies to one individual because like I I'm someone who will cry for the most random things <laughs> not necessarily for things people assume that I would cry for Hmm. um like a huge loss might not make me cry right. but something which people would look at okay that's not that deeply impactful would would make me cry so i i i'm on that spectrum of things and i always wondered does that make me less emotionally connected to to bigger things and more emotionally connected to really tiny things yeah. um is the wiring different so over analyze at your own risk <laughs> first of all <laughs> you cannot uh, tell anybody not over analyze now we have enough information thanks to yeah. thanks to everything which we've been reading that's the yeah. thing so when we when we read about things like this hmm. uh, we have to be very patient before jumping into conclusions yeah. but at the same time it is very interesting and we are all narcissistic we want to know we want to be talked about we want to understand ourselves more nothing yeah. wrong in that yeah my take on this is that different people will have will experience that sense of loss of control at different things mm. so somebody who has been through a business sold a business doing doing something professionally has a loss they've been through it before they know how to deal with that but something new something that they cannot control even if it is momentarily would probably trigger a tear for that one moment because it signals transient helplessness somebody who is uh, trading for the first time and they lose their first lakh for example yeah they might cry yeah for you know, sure they'll think of all the things they could have bought with that 
money and all that but then somebody who's experienced 30 years trading they know that these things happen yeah. so that ability to make that jump is a learned one so the more information you have or other as you get older you have more you have less reasons to cry for everything which also would mean why kids cry a lot more when they are like say toddlers babies because the yeah. tiniest thing is a, they don't have memory of past experience yeah everything will make them feel helpless yeah. so feeling a little hungry will make them feel helpless yeah. so right from that point uh, not getting a toy not getting more screen time they are constantly feeling helpless they have no control <laughs> I feel the most the interesting part about this is that it's also like these are smaller t- triggers, right? I mean, we'll, we'll cry for different things. You will you will get angry for different things. Um, you you will you will see how people laugh, and you'll. I think we generalize a lot of these emotions, mm-hmm. but like you said, you you shouldn't over generalize, but you shouldn't go too. You shouldn't over analyze as well, yeah. because you can go really into like random territory. but if you take a step back and look at something like let's say narcissism for instance you mentioned mm. narcissism how much of that is how our minds are wired and how much of it is the things we see as we grow up now this is my take hmm. i feel narcissism is inbuilt it's it's almost like a survival technique hmm. if you don't care for yourself it's so evolution has failed <laughs> basically <laughs> because then what's stopping you from yeah. you know crossing a road without looking on either side because you don't care yeah. but it's that self self love um which is on that spectrum of narcissism for me the very interesting thing is that when somebody does something very selfless it's not really selfless it's just that whatever they're doing that selfless thing for they consider that person as a part of them hmm. and so it's easy to sacrifice so you know mothers sacrificing themselves for their kids the famous harry potter story mm. uh, even in say in in war like you know soldiers doing that you have to feel a sense of identity with the person that you're sacrificing anything for so i feel narcissism is uh, required you need to feel that and and for the people who are higher on the spectrum of people who don't care as much for others but their focus is on self preservation more than anything else right. so would you say that's a spectrum that you kind of veer towards yeah so if your identity doesn't leave your body at all <laughs> and you are you have no everything space is me. for everything is me then it becomes pathological that is a problem if you you can't function in society that way yeah you have to expand your identity you have to have something else that's where you go to megalomaniac that's literally where you kind of go right, right? so there's nobody else but me yeah. that is a problem now if, let's say that you're on this side of the spectrum and i, I don't don't think it's just a narcissism thing but when you're taking decisions for instance mm. um there's a question here saying you know when you're taking decisions you're at peace with yourself when you make the right decisions mm. but how do you stay at peace with yourself when you make the wrong ones because your mind's triggering the fact that you did this wrong like right. you know data is being fed in there how does the decision making part i know you tapped into this but especially with like your mind being at peace with some when something goes wrong right is that a obviously a, a natural triggering mechanism but and but can it also be trained to not trigger that way so when we when we take any decision we take it with the full certainty that this is the right one generally we nobody will do something knowing that this is going to yeah. harm me we, because they have done some calculation and at the end of that calculation they have decided that this is the thing to do yeah when circumstances prove you wrong all of that guilt or regret is basically just your brain trying to teach you a lesson mm. so that you don't do it again so i have a very optimistic view of the brain i don't think it's an evil character yeah i think the brain is like a very you know concerned elderly uncle who just wants to you know make sure ki beta yeah. i you, you know you should learn this this is for your own good so it it will make you feel bad it will send you to your room because you know you don't you shouldn't do it again the silly thing is that it will keep doing it no matter how old you are that's true <laughs> even if you are 40 50 your brain can still punish you 
for doing something wrong yeah. instead of just trusting you just like okay you will you will learn from this yeah. so this kind of self talk helps me when when my brain is <laughs> making me feel bad about a decision I, I remind myself this i've always real found realized and something was i was being told today at home is that i am a clear cut case of an idle mind is a is a devil's workshop <laughs> because if you leave my mind to not have something to do right now mm. there will be no can of worms but i will invent a can of worms for my mind to really sit and over analyze and think about which brings me to the point that is constant action almost like a great way to build habits be productive give our mind something to do mm. rather than saying no sit in inaction I know there are two schools. Right? Meditation is inaction, right? But is constant action also a, a great way to kind of build that in? I feel that we don't fast enough hmm. in general yeah. now because of the way that um, society is constructed. There is an overabundance of everything. So whether it's food, entertainment, anything you want, there is too much of it, and so fasting has become vital. it should become the norm it used to be the norm even when there wasn't so much abundance yeah. and now it's become even more important and that also means uh, fasting in terms of information uh, and knowledge gain which sounds counter counterintuitive you feel that no amount of knowledge is too much knowledge but i don't think so i think there is such a thing as too much knowledge it depends on are you using it mm. so Technically, there's no amount of food that is too much food if you're burning it off. Yeah. But you can't burn off so much, right? You have one pizza that's enough for a week, but you can't burn off so much. So, either you build up your habits to a level where you are burning off that much knowledge, and by burning off, I mean putting it out there again, using it in some form, talking about it, writing a blog post, making a video, something. You have to use it in some way. or reduce your intake hmm. because where does all that go what do you do with all that information and that can in fact i believe that too much information is a source of threat because now you have too much what do you do because you are trying to remember it also every reel that you see has information and imagine your brain is just constantly trying to figure out what to remember what to remember is this important because for your brain it doesn't really matter if it's life saving or not it's just trying to figure out what is important what should i keep what should i not the cognitive effort that your brain is going through these days is tragic it's overload right it's an overload um i mean the world's one of the world's most famous um, i mean self guinea pigs as he calls himself mm. tim ferris he, oh, yeah. i was watching something he says that I think every he does is like quarterly things, right? He says every quarter he has this one week of fasting mm. of information where he goes off somewhere, um, no, no internet, no nothing, um, not allowed to read, but he's allowed to write. Nice. And he says that's really almost like a reset he does for his mind every three months. Yeah. So when he comes back, he's like, okay, it's like it's, it's that one week long reboot that he does. Amazing. I think that's so important for all of us. Right? We need those reboots. Otherwise, like it's like we have a barrage all and the time. it's a never-ending cycle of because um, you now wake up at night with stuff. I I feel like we are scrolling through stuff in our sleep now. <laughs> at some point, I think in our sleep we're all like swiping like this. How many times has this happened that you pick up the phone for something else and you find yourself scrolling mm. without even realizing when did the app open? Yeah. You know, you wanted to check somebody's phone number and suddenly you are laughing at some TikTok or some video. Yeah. and you you don't you have no recollection of how you got there because those networks of opening the app and starting to scroll have become so wired yeah like it's not a decision anymore yeah. it just happens i was doing something the other day and i didn't realize it till someone pointed it out to me is that imagine i'm talking to you um and i have my hands on my phone and i'm typing a message but i'm not looking at the screen because now my fingers intuitively remember where the keypad yeah. things are and i look back and when that was pointed out i looked down and my message was perfect there was no Amazing. typos thanks to autocorrect also i give autocorrect <laughs> credit sometimes um, but you're right because 
you almost intuitively do it now it's no longer yeah. uh, oh i have to do this that reflex that you go to yeah and the more we do that at a young age are we then almost like wiring people at at a younger age to function so differently from how any of us function cuz i was born pre internet mm. and i feel that's a blessing for me because i was born at the right time pre internet like you know you're not too old you're yeah. you're right on that spectrum of look okay, i've enjoyed brief period of no internet then brief period of dial up internet yeah. which nobody did, if you are young you don't even know what dial up internet oh, yeah. is that sound is embedded in my mind same yeah. <laughs> um and to eventually this but let's say someone born in the early 2000s oh. can you i the old wiring is gone does that necessarily mean that i mean you don't know what that effect is going to be till i would say another decade down the line um uh, it's fascinating because to the brain it is such a fluid thing you throw anything at it and it will just absorb yeah and the younger you throw at it the faster it will absorb it so whether it's languages whether it's learning to roller skate or whether it's learning to use a mobile phone it's it becomes natural because that is the part of the world like i have a cousin who is 2 years old and she can open up a mobile phone type in the password without having any idea of what a password is yeah but this is just natural it's a part of the universe now yeah she knows what numbers to type and she can open up youtube and start her video and i was amazed at this like, who taught her nobody she just observed her parents doing it and she start she started doing it yeah in a way great because they have to grow up in that world so they have a head start which is why there are kids who are 18 19 who are coming up with startup ideas and creating billion dollar companies because that's the world they grew up in yeah much more challenging for somebody who is 40 yeah because that's not their basic thinking isn't like that they have to force themselves to learn a lot of new stuff it's just a challenge for anyone who is about 30 i think to constantly keep updating themselves so you've actually flipped it around mm-hmm. you're saying it's easier for someone born closer to now 100% so there is no so basically i my hypothesis is is wrong because my assumption was someone who understands old world and new world in a balanced form at that correct period mm. would have the advantage if you want to call it that Mm. was it someone who's too close to the present or too far away from it so the way i think of it is um, for them technology is their mother tongue true and for us it's something that we've learned in school that is also we true. can never ever gain that same level of fluency as somebody who's just brought up speaking that language which also ma- makes me think about the fact there was a recent article about obviously open ai and chat gpt being oh, yeah. what they are I so said the worry for someone like Google is that today Google still predominant, but for mm. someone who is very young and discovered ChatGPT now, yeah. it will be the only way to function with search as they're growing up. But they won't even get like, what is this Google thing? Why should I look at? Yeah. Why can't I just have a conversation with my search assistant? Absolutely. Because if you think of uh, how we used to find information 50 years ago, we used to go and ask around. or find an encyclopedia for people or, to remember what that was yeah a library for god's sake yeah and look up things but uh, then google came along but even google seems so outdated now because it will give us websites yeah different sources of information that you have to physically click and search and find out and make your own decisions yeah what is this nonsense gpt just tells us whatever yeah. we want to know yeah it's a it's a very interesting world which then always takes me towards because i am a junkie for sci-fi hmm. takes me towards how far away for anybody who's watched terminator are we from judgment day uh from like because the more we understand our mind yeah. the more we will feed that into technology yeah and the more we feed it into technology at some point technology technology is like I know everything about all your triggers, and yeah. then you're not veering towards judgment; you're veering towards the matrix. There are a lot of things uh, in the matrix that can happen, uh, if not exactly the same way. Uh, one is when they bring Neo out of the 
you know in from the real world hmm. they find his muscles have all atrophied yeah because he's never used them yeah 100% that can For happen sure, yeah. once we are all in the in in VR yeah why would we need our yeah. muscles it's almost like what happens to someone who's i mean been in like a long coma right it takes so long correct. to kind of get back there correct um so that is something that can definitely happen um the other thing that can happen is uh, in the movie her hmm. yeah uh where you have you can have very fulfilling relationships with an artificial intelligence with an artificial intelligence because they would probably know you better than any human can and once you get used to that i don't know how like you would be spoiled right yeah. because they would answer the way you want them to they will say the things you want to, want them to hear uh, or you want to hear so these are certain things i feel are inevitable so it's as important to understand the mind but also as important don't tell technology really. <laughs> <laughs> keep some of the stuff for yourself oh things are going to go bad because somebody gives a command in the best of intentions hmm. they would say something like save humanity hmm. something really stupid like that and that's going to screw us all up yeah because problem with humanity is humanity and <laughs> ai will figure that out You know, one of my favorite series on this is a series called Love Death and Robots oh, on yeah. Netflix which gives you the most dystopian <laughs> um versions of what that could yeah. lead to I love that one. and a lot of those actually veer towards the mind right because you, you yeah. I mean the more you can program it I mean for me I thought you would say for the matrix would be that you could plug in and learn jiu jitsu it's very <laughs> possible that tomorrow you could yeah. but if you start learning about how the mind works from a young age and you know it sticks then you are also enhancing yourself to i mean really reach peak potential which right now i don't think any human being is utilizing their brain power to its like even 50% of its capacity hmm. so there's also the positive side apart from the dystopian side yeah so here we come into like a philosophical question hmm. what's the point true what's the point of learning jiu jitsu in 5 minutes then what because you take away the fun of the of the learning experience correct and also if you can do it that means everybody can do it yeah so then the only difference between you and somebody else would be what muscle strength so then again you have to physically go and work out but if you're saying that ma- machines can make your muscles strong for you yeah then, you're sitting in a machine is going to, it's going right so if if everybody is now equal in that way what are we doing here what's what what's <laughs> any of this for <laughs> what are we doing here what is any of this for is is a is a great point to reach one hour into a conversation about the mind is how i'd like to put it oh, that's so trippy <laughs> but the the beauty of it is that you know i always believed and i i reinforced more and more is the more you read science fiction hmm. i feel you truly understand where the future might go yeah a lot better than anything else and and what i also like about that is it really dips into science and i feel that often times we look at the fiction part a lot more look not look at the science and the yeah. more we look at science as something that is exciting to learn exciting to tap into mm. and to really understand not just ourselves but how it affects the world i think we are at that crucial point as well we figured a way to make some parts of education less complex mm. and a lot more fun yeah so if 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 you know people are going to be playing games and gamifying things if you can teach science um in a way that is fun and gamified and it's interesting and it's i feel that's really where i feel the line is is that you know yeah. where we will find the line of really progressing is to understand our mind in a way to to figure out what the point is to to phrase what is what is the point of it all we <laughs> figure out what that point is and i feel that might eventually be the the last human thing the last human thing is to figure the point of it all the machine will figure everything else mm. i think we'll just be figuring out the point of what yeah. we're doing because the search for our identity is never going to stop so we have a tendency to aggregate in hordes mm. to in tribes because we want identity but as soon as we come into a tribe now we want our own identity yeah so we want to be separate if you are faced with an external threat we want to be herded together hmm. but when there's nothing else threatening us we want to be separate we want to grow yeah so that is never going to change 
we are we will always seek to have our own thing so if everybody's learned jiu jitsu mm. probably the person who hasn't learned jiu jitsu will stand out that's true which is what the counter culture is always about so you will notice this in children A- every generation will find some way to disobey their parents mm. so the more and here's a parenting <laughs> <laughs> uh, nightmare the more understanding you are the more you're pushing your kid to find some crazy ass thing to rebel with mm. so if you if you're okay with tattoos that's tattoos out of the window because what's yeah. the point of getting a tattoo now yeah. and if you're okay with them driving a bike that's also out of the window so they will keep because they need to find their own identity who am i against the backdrop of all other children yeah and this instinct is never going to go so uh, i feel that even from that perspective so important to have this conversation of this is what your brain is doing understand where this instinct is coming from mm. and then take a call yeah. so this is what informed decision making looks like yeah instead of just being swept away by it all i think informed decision making is a i feel that's not just a kids thing anymore i feel that so yeah. many adults need to be taught that as well but yeah. i guess if you teach it in a simplified and actionable way yeah i feel more people will and I, i honestly come to believe that the reason why people are so much more interested in how the mind works in the recent few years is because it's finally being presented to them in a in a way that a they find it engaging yeah but it's also like it doesn't feel like oh my god like i can't figure this one out yeah for me the most important thing about what neuroscience is offering is it gives you a structure hmm. to see yourself see the world see your experiences in a different light so every generation had its own structure so maybe 5 centuries ago it was religion that big be- that became the protocol that became the lens through which you know you see yeah. everything and then there was psychology so I feel that now we are entering a phase where we can look at everything from a neuroscience perspective and that is closer to the truth because it's closer to biology it is closer mm. to science mm. than anything has been till now and that's the promise it's not of course there yet completely there are a lot of things that neuroscience can't answer yeah. but I like the direction in which it is yeah. going yeah. yeah I can keep going on but we'll always leave some stuff <laughs> to bring you back on for I feel this is a conversation where we unraveled a bunch of things for people to think about. Yeah. Um I'm hoping it does the same thing for the people who listened and then watched in which which is going on in my mind right now is that I'm trying to unravel and and think about and literally like you know you're soaking in all the stuff you've discussed. Yeah. Um so thank you so much for coming on and 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 sharing all that you've shared. My pleasure. It's always fun to have these conversations with you.